All right, good afternoon. Are we ready? All right, we're, on, we're live. Let's do it. We're, we're live. live. Derek, good morning. So, good morning. Or, good morning, actually. It's now noon time. Good we're afternoon. Halfway through the day. Um, so, today we're going to talk about uh, the California equivalent of TEFCA, the data exchange framework. And let, let me stop you right there. Yeah. Okay. The data exchange framework is not the equivalent of TEFCA. It, it is a framework. It, it does support data exchange, but it has a very different history and a very different set of intents than TEFCA. And uh, we should highlight how it and is similar to and differs from TEFCA. Yes, exactly. So the purpose of today's talk is to highlight some of those differences. Um, Stephen can certainly speak extensively to the history of it, but also we can talk about some of the practical applications of um, what we're seeing as we've started to do uh, some of the initial exchange purposes under te uh, under TEFCA, under the data exchange framework. So, let me see if... Can we advance? I'm we trying advancing? to advance. There, oh, there we, we go. go. All, right. All right. I feel like I should be standing here. Right. So, um, Health Gorilla has been approved as a qualified health information in organization in California under the data exchange framework. Oh, there we go, that's better. Um, we are one of the nine organizations that have been so approved, uh, went through a vetting process, um, and at this point, those are the, the only organizations that there are. Um, Stephen, do you want to talk well, about... Well, just to, to add to that, so you'll, you'll note that there are seven QHINs, Qualified Health Information Networks, on the National Trusted Exchange Framework. There are nine QHIOs, Qualified Health Information Organizations, on the, the state side in California, uh, unlike in TEFCA where additional QHINs are going to be coming on, there's two more in the pipeline now, uh, in California there's no intention to open this up further. Uh, there are also some key differences in that all TEFCA exchange on the federal framework needs to go through a QHIN. In California, QHIO is optional. Uh, Q the California Data Exchange Framework has a set of requirements uh, for data exchange. It's a legal requirement in the state that all providers and really most healthcare actors sign the data sharing agreement at the state level and begin to exchange data uh, using the, the principles and requirements of the data exchange framework. But it doesn't have to go through one of these QHIOs. You can meet the requirements of the law by, by any means possible. Yep, and um, I'm trying to see if there's, so here you can see obviously there's Health Gorilla, there are a few of the other organizations that are QHIOs and don't necessarily need to rattle off all of their names, but um, let's see. Well, the other thing here has to do with the compliance date. So this, you, you mentioned the history, this was a long time coming in California, a lot of efforts on the part of a number of parties to try to really encourage data exchange in the state and and to really coming at it, California being what it is, from the standpoint of social care. So really trying to go beyond providers and patients to include social care, to work with the safety net, to really be able to exchange data for additional purposes of use and additional data types. So again, this is a legal requirement in the state. There's no there's no uh, enforcement. So you know. It, 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 what, it, what does it mean to be a legal requirement? Um, the uh, requirement uh, went into effect for most providers and payers. This uh, does include payers um, and other data holders the beginning of this year, but small rural hospitals and some other small medical groups have another couple of years before they have to comply. But as a QHIO, we've been working with the community of QHIOs and with the state uh, to really try to sort of clarify what does this mean for everybody? So we'll go through that a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. So making sure this thing has a lag here. If I press, okay. So one of the ways I think that's useful to look at the components of the data exchange framework is to compare it to the current interoperability network. So the care qualities, the commonwealths, the QHINs, that sort of thing. Um, and there's really two orthogonal dimensions that this expands beyond the sort of floor of treatment exchange that's that's out there already that's you know largely working across the US. Um, so we have in the corner here we've got this foundational uh, national networks like Care Quality, eHealth Exchange, Commonwealth, 
naturally uh, health girl is a Q-hin. And then there are other data types, as Stephen uh, highlighted, that are being added to it that go beyond just you know exchanging CCDs. And then there are other participants and purposes of use that it's expanded into. So if you view you know CCD exchange for treatment as your sort of foundational element that you you know more or less can do already independent of QHIO um, or QHIO is sometimes they like to make you actually spell it all out. Um, they also added in a requirement to share ADT notifications, so mandating those encounter notifications, the alerts, uh, which is very... For hospitals for, and emergency departments. For hospitals and emergency departments, they are supposed to go live uh, also on the 31st, but they've actually... Well, all the hospitals were supposed to sign by the 31st. Apparently, July 31st is the actual deadline for the implementation of the ADTs. Um, and so, in effect, um, we're creating a network of networks where the different QHIOs that have these various participant connections from these different hospital systems, we're working out the, the specific technological logistics so that we're able to send those alerts out to the appropriate parties who have signed the, the data sharing agreement, the but DSA. But specifically, it's, it's an, again, a, an important differentiation of what we're doing in California. Because, of course, the CMS rules about ADT notifications came out a couple years ago. But there, it's really based on a, a patient or a patient's representative requesting that a, a hospital send ADTs to, to somebody. In California, this is a requirement across the board for all hospitals and emergency departments to send their ADTs ADTs to a health information organization and then for those entities to share them amongst themselves to really set up a statewide network of ADTs. Uh, and again, you know, you have to have a legally valid reason, you have to be involved in the care of the patient, etc., to, to subscribe to those ADTs, mm -hmm. but this is really pushing forward, you know, with government requirements, something that the, the industry has been kind of slowly moving towards over time. Right, and, and to further differentiate it, the CMS rules around the conditions of, conditions of, part, no, uh, COP, I forget yeah, what the acronym is. Conditions of participation. Conditions of partici uh, from participation the from the hospitals. Um, the assumptions and the way that that was worked out was largely the self-declared information that gets put in the ADT. If, so if the patient remembers to identify their primary care provider or their practice that they're affiliated with, that would be taken care of. But it largely hasn't, in my opinion, moved the needle in terms of broad sharing of ADT as much as I'm sure it was hoped to. Whereas the California mandate is much more in the traditional, I would say, roster-based or patient population-based um, sharing of ADT data so that if there's a payer, if there's a care plan, if there's a, uh, a campaign that a particular provider organization is doing around a particular uh, care cohort, um, facilitating those notifications so that you know um, treatment follow-ups can occur and in as seamless a way as possible. So again, differentiating what CMS has done and say what HIEs have done uh, versus what's part of the the QHI or the data exchange framework. Um, I'll, I'll just jump ahead. Yeah. Uh, we might have come to it at a later slide, but uh, one of the questions comes up about sort of what a, what does a provider organization need to do differently to satisfy the requirements of the data exchange framework than what they're already doing? Like I practice today at Sutter Health in California, you know, big organization. We've been working on interoperability for years, you know, and like what is what does this new requirement really mean? The ADT requirement is really the big new thing if you're a provider organization in California that there was not this requirement to have an outbound interface, essentially, for your ADTs to a central location. So that's, you know, regardless of what EHR you're using, et cetera, that's a new requirement. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Uh, and then further going into some of the differences on the content side, um, just like, uh, you know, PHI was largely defined in the context of HIPAA, uh, the data exchange framework created something called HH HSSI, which is healthcare and social services information, and bringing in um, social services information into a protected class of information that is to be shared and required to be shared. So the the third tier, at least in the on the content axis here, is to add in that social services data so that you can facilitate the exchange with um, you know food banks, uh, community-based organizations, a variety of other uh, care holders, uh, and that's largely for the social determinants of health 
uh, and health equity aspects of care, which you know California is really leading the charge on in that space. The other thing in terms of the payload that's worth noting is that while national exchange has largely been driven by the requirements of CCDs and FHIR and USCDI version 1, uh, the California data exchange framework, we, we planted the flag in USCDI version 2 um, from the beginning, you know, which is a slightly larger data set now. The new national standard as of two days ago is USCDI version 3 under the new the ONC's HTI 1 rule. But, uh, but again, there's no legal requirement for, HT, for version 3 under HTI 1 until the beginning of 2026 uh, when the certified health IT vendors need to be able to support that. But in California, version 2 is already a requirement. And we actually had a discussion in our, in our committee meeting last week that maybe we should move California to version 3 um, even earlier than the, the federal requirement. Absolutely. Um, and I, by the way, I think this will be the main slide because the rest of the ones are are very well. I think this will I, conveys those differences and highlights, so we can probably spend most of our time here. But um, now, if we shift over to the other axis, where we're talking about other purposes of use. So again, you know, right now it's very easy to exchange data for treatment purposes. It's sort of a universal uh, acknowledgement, and people freely exchange, assuming it is for treatment. Billions um, of exchanges a year through the Care Quality Framework today. It just—it's a vast amount of information. So that's great, but of course there are many other actors in healthcare that need data for other purposes of use, and HIPAA allows for payment and operations. And so that was actually explicitly called for in the data exchange framework to enable the sharing of data so that... To require. To require, thank you. Uh, require the sharing of data for purposes of use around payment and operations, which was actually... Which, which is huge. Right. I mean, it, it really is. Getting exchange for those purposes of use on the national framework has been incredibly difficult. You know, the, yes. the treatment safe harbor, if you will, you know, has been well, well established, embraced by all actors. But once you start talking about payment and operations, you're talking about sharing data between providers and payers, and that's challenging. Uh, there's all kinds of issues about, you know, protecting your, your market, not sharing too much data, et cetera, et cetera, repurposing of data. So that's been really, that was so much of the genesis of the data exchange framework was payers really wanting to open that can and be able to get at more data, and that was a big driver behind this law. Yeah, or anyone bearing risk who really wanted to do, you know, care coordination, but in a perhaps more efficient means of having more types of care coordinators other than specifically providers um, facilitating, you know, um, helping patients with managing chronic conditions and so forth. So yeah, and it's not that payment and healthcare operations exchange isn't happening today. It's just not happening efficiently. So you end up, you know, metering the gates just by the inefficiency that's out there and that makes people who want to not share data or hold on to data a little bit happier because they know even though it's legal and even though it's happening, it's not happening much. So when you open this up and you make this more efficient, when you digitize you know, and streamline the exchange, then the floodgates open. And, uh, and so in Calif whereas in TEFCA, in the federal framework, you know, it supports exchange for payment and operations. We're still in the process of defining as part of this year's iteration of TEFCA what are going to be the standard operating procedures around those exchanges, where they're going to start. In California, they just they just named them and they said it's required and you got to do it. And now, now we're in the process of figuring out what does that really mean? You know, and I think as a QHIO uh, on the new, the new data exchange framework, we're working with participants who are payers who are coming to Health Gorilla and saying, okay, we want it, we got to check this box. We see we've got this requirement to do this thing and help us do that. And and I'm really impressed. I mean they're they're coming forward with real enthusiasm and they're asking very good questions. You know, what does it mean? How how can I do this? What data do I need to exchange and how? And you maybe you can talk about some of the process we've yep. gone through to figure that out with them. Yeah, we were originally hoping it could be as simple as just the same full-on document-based exchange um, as we're doing on treatment. There were some concerns to scope it in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, HIPAA's minimum necessary. 
So what we're doing is, a, I think, a reasonable compromise is basically date limiting the, the retrieval period. So you can't say, give me the universe of data on a patient, because usually for an operations or a, a payment thing, there's either a specific source or a specific time range that you're a talking specific about. Encounter a specific encounter or episode. Or and so the, the default that we're coming to is a maximum query of one year in length. You know, everything is a compromise, and you have to... There are situations where this might not do, like if you're doing a HEDIS score and you need a colorectal screening and they've done it you know, eight years ago, but for the vast majority, people are comfortable with using a year time window or narrower, obviously, if you're looking for a specific encounter um, in the context of the, the payment or operations. And that's what we're working forward and getting baked into the, the um the SOPs around the, those two purposes of use. The other purposes of use that the data exchange framework does call out are individual access services and public health <laughs> uh, without a lot of definition. Um, but again, very aspirational. We're very aspirational in California. Um, and uh, But for the individual access services, interestingly, they actually stopped short. In most of the things we've been talking about, California is trying to move ahead mm -hmm. of the feds. But in individual access, they've definitely stopped short of that. They're really, they're just saying this is co sort of the information blocking. If you need data, you can go to somebody and ask for it. There's nothing really new there, as opposed to the, the TEFCA IAS purpose of use, which is really about being able to federate out mm -hmm. a patient query, a patient going to an IAS provider, working with a QHIN, getting their query out with the goal of being able to collect all of the data for a patient. That's not what they're doing in California, at least initially. Yeah, they, uh, I would go as far as to say, and maybe I'm more critical, and you're far kinder than I am, Stephen. I think they, they botched that a little bit because it still now requires a patient to go to each of the individual sources. It can roll up to a QHIO, but then there's still nine of them. So what we have today with the whole smart on fire approach prior to QHIN is you can log into one EMR, and then you can log into another EMR, and you can log into a third EMR, and then a fourth EMR. Now we can log into one QHIO and log into another QHIO and log into a third QHIO. Um, that's there's only nine. There's only nine. So it's marginally better versus, you know, potentially hundreds of EMRs. Um, and we will, again, I like, yeah, I enjoy Health Gorilla because we like pushing the envelope. And we are, you know, trying to get, you know, see if we can push that forward and be a little bit more QHIN-like. Because I think the IAS approach from QHIN with the individual access and the IL-2 ver verification is a a far better approach, uh, certainly from a patient advocate perspective, getting access it to the data. It is interesting. The socio-political background behind the data exchange framework is very different than behind TEFCA. And, uh, and, and now trying to get them to merge together, uh, Mickey Trapathy and, and uh, one of the California public health officials put out a, an article in Health Affairs a couple weeks ago where they were basically sort of saying, oh yeah, these things are just, they're consistent, they've got the same goals, they're heading in the right direction. So I think there is a little bit of uh, attempt within California to really make that so, to really try to align the data exchange framework more with TEFCA. But it actually started sooner. I mean, again, it's like six, seven years in the making. So the fact that there needs to be a little bit of course correction to get it aligned is not, not surprising. And, you know, and in the, in the individual access, basically, IAS within data exchange framework is, is meaningless. Basically, it just falls back to the federal floor for individual access, which is much more you know, specific and, and actionable. Absolutely. So then the, the last piece, you know, continuing out towards Stephen here, um, the, the interesting thing about the data exchange framework is that it brings in new participants that have not traditionally, well, it mandates bringing in new participants that have been um, I don't want to say on the periphery, but they've been involved in healthcare. Unengaged. Un insufficiently engaged. Um, and so the community-based organizations are now you know, considered first-class citizens, and they have actually done some nice work to um, elevate the protection of the HIPAA data, the traditional HIPAA data, to align with the, the importance of the, the social services data um, and so there's uh, actual explicit consent so that you're sharing HIPAA data with, say, a community-based organization, which is not a covered entity under HIPAA, 
but uh, in California, they have to protect the data with the same level of rigor as you have under the privacy and security um, aspects of, of HIPAA, which is a nice protection. Which is really a very tall order. I mean, if you're a food bank or a homeless shelter, to say that you are meeting HIPAA privacy and security requirements, it's just not a thing. I mean, it, it's, it's really, it's an aspirational goal. But that is what was written into the law in California, was to say anybody who exchanges this health and social services information, uh, leveraging this now required framework, um, is, is held to the standards of HIPAA. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Right, and the, the consent is bi-directional in that the, organiz the patient has to consent that their social services data can be shared with the providers as well. So that part was thought, I think, was thought through as well. But yes, the, the security is a tall burden for a food bank, and hopefully California has some sort of plan to help some of those CBOs. But at the same time, if you lower the standard of information security, you could have that be a place where you know data breaches occur, and so it's, it's that that delicate balancing act um, to make sure that you, you know, are, are promoting the health equity, the sharing of the information, which can help, you know, outcomes greatly with the desire to protect and make sure, you know, given what happened to change healthcare, you know, in the past few weeks, you know, it's an ever present threat to, uh, you know, actors trying to steal um, healthcare data about, you know, U.S. citizens. So. It's also worth really going back and focusing on the fact that this includes payers, uh, because payers, you know, while they're covered actors um, under, or no, they're hip, they're covered entities under HIPAA. They're not covered actors under information blocking, uh, but they are required participants under the data exchange framework. Uh, and again, this this real encouragement of exchange or requirement of exchange for payment healthcare operations. So, you know, California is a very big state tons of transactions, it's going to give us an opportunity to really test out some of these new exchange patterns, you know, within a framework within a state that we anticipate will be coming, you know, to, to a TEFCA near you, you know, over the course of the coming years. Absolutely. Um, so let's see what else we have in here. <laughs> so um, one of the other things, this is a bit of a, you know, talking about Health Gorilla here, um, we're the only organization that is both certified um, with TEFCA and with the data exchange framework. So um, we're trying to facilitate this compliance so that people don't need to go to one organization for one purpose and another organization for another. Um, that's all basically handled through our technology stack and our, our privacy and security policies and procedures. Um, so certainly if you're an organization doing business in California, this is, this is an easy button that would right. allow you to address both of these requirements. It's a twofer, you know. <laughs> Um, then I think, actually... I, I heard this morning on a panel I did, feeding two birds with one scone. That's like an that. interesting one. <laughs> that's like saying that that ship, has, that ship has left the station or that train has <laughs> sailed. Um, I think the rest of this is largely a little bit, you know, uh, talking... Let's see, what do we got? Um, so I think this is more marketing stuff that has been added into here. So from a high-level perspective, we've given the, the key... Yeah, we've talked through all this. Yeah, we've talked through all of these pieces. So I think we can leave it here if, if anyone has any, any questions? particular questions. Yeah. Yes. Well, let's answer those two questions separately. So the question is, are QHIOs themselves um, connected? And part of the, the excitement of the past few months has been figuring that out. You know, they named these nine QHIOs, but again, the, you don't have to exchange through a QHIO. The QHIOs have to be able to share the ADT data, but what about, you know, what about IAS, for example? What about other exchanges? So yes, we are working through that. The technology of that is actually quite interesting. You know, how do they connect with one another? Because these have been largely independent. Most of these are, you know, regionally based HIEs that stepped up to be QHIOs. There are three of us that are private companies. Uh, only four of us, I think, even have the ability to reach across the entire state. So the answer to that is yes, we're figuring that out. Do you want to talk about how we're like leveraging eHealth Exchange to make that work? Yeah, so um, back to the purposes of use, we had hoped that we were going to get all three of them out of the gate. Um, but we, you know, again, focused on treatment to get the initial data flowing because um, 
we decided to leverage the existing national networks because there was actually a connectivity requirement in the data exchange framework that you had to be a member of one of the national networks. HQ Ohio needed Each to specify that they were connected to one of the one of a specified subset of national networks. Exactly, yes. Um, and so we have been leveraging both care equality and eHealth Exchange for data exchange for the treatment purpose amongst the QHIOs. Um, but we recognize that that won't be a viable solution once we get to payment and operations because of the... Because the networks don't support those. Well, fundamentally, yes. Yeah, it, it, that's the short answer. Um, so we will probably wind up going for point-to-point -point connections uh, among nine participants, which is, you know... Uh, Come on, you're the, you're the mathematician here. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's an N squared thing. But yeah, the, the actual, you basically, everyone has to connect to eight other folks. Yeah. So, um, but that's still within the realm of feasibility, especially if you're used to doing, you know, this level of interoperability. All the QHIOs are very familiar, have um, good health, uh, tech, yeah, tech health stacks to facilitate that exchange. The interesting part is how we're going to weave in the folks who are not on a QHIO, who are participating in data exchange framework, and will also have to comply with those other queries. Um, you know, so we could theoretically use care quality and eHealth Exchange to connect to, you know, the vast majority of the the data exchange framework participants. But once you start again going into the payment and operations use cases, you get into some uh, challenges there. So uh, I do think more of the participants that are currently going it alone, so to speak, will ultimately join into a QHIO because I think they'll realize that it's better, easier in the long run to have a network provider that's connected to the other QHIOs. But uh, again, there's, there's a lot of learning going on and a lot of sorting out and uh, juggling and balancing of these, these exchange frameworks. I was just going to comment on the other, the second part of your question had to do with, you know, does, a, does it, would an individual looking for their data need to go to each of the QHIOs? You can, but that, that doesn't get you what you need because, again, you don't have to connect to a QHIO at this point. So you really need to go to every data holder, you know, and, and request your data independently. The going to a QHIO, what we've heard from the one other QHIO that's sort of engaged in this discussion is they're just going to give you the data that they already have stored in their data bank. You know, they're, they're not even going to federate the query out to their connected entities, you know, to get the freshest data that's available. So, it, you know, on the, on the IAS side, it doesn't, it doesn't buy you anything. I mean, one of the QHIOs is San Diego Health Connect. I've never gotten healthcare in San Diego. I don't have any data there. It's just there's no reason to go looking at it. So, are from the folks here, are there any other questions? All right, well then, thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully this was enlightening, and uh, if you have any other... And we'll post it to the web. And we'll post it to the web, absolutely. Thank you, Stephen.